Chapter 15, Solution Chemistry. The beginning of this is not math, it's conceptual, but it's stuff that you already knew, hey guys, from like eighth grade, matter can be subdivided into two categories. Pure substances where there's only one thing. You guys remember that thing? That thing could be made up of two things, like H2O and CO2 have two things in it, but a pure sample of water and a pure sample of CO2 is a pure substance, okay? A mixture is not a pure substance. It's composed of a bunch of stuff. So CO2 by itself, all CO2 is not a mixture. It's a pure substance called carbon dioxide gas. A mixture can be divided into two things. Homogeneous means it looks the same. Hetero means it looks different. Now just focus on the blue part of my lava lamp, not the wax on the bottom. I'll try to hold it this way. This is a homogeneous mixture because it's composed of water, a little bit of alcohol, and obviously blue food coloring. So it's a mixture, but it looks the same, so it's homogeneous. Now look, here you can see that there's a difference, there's lava, I'm um, sorry, uh, wax and water. So it's heterogeneous mixture, which is yes matter. A solution, sorry, a homogeneous mixture is known as a solution. There are solid, liquid, and gaseous solutions. We're breathing a gaseous solution right now. What is it? Air. Room air. It's a mixture that looks the same. Well, it can't even tell what it looks like, right? And that is matter, yes. So it's a homogeneous gaseous solution, a mixture of gases. Um, the other thing is called a colloid. I don't know that if you've heard this word before. It is a mixture, and it looks the same. Um, I'll show you a, a slide of a bunch of different colloids. The difference between these two things is the particle size. That's it, just the particle size. These particles are slightly bigger than these. Neither particle is big enough that gravity will make it fall to the bottom. If that's the case, it's called a suspension. So this is actually a suspension. The wax fell to the bottom, okay? Orange juice, if you've ever looked at a glass of orange juice that's been sitting a while, the bottom the, has the, the most dense uh, material and it's thin at the top. You have to shake it because the particles were suspended. So it's a heterogeneous mixture. You don't have to shake a colloid. It's always in suspension. They aren't big, the particles aren't big enough to fall to the bottom. Yes, So all heterogeneous uh, mixtures are suspensions? No, uh, raisins and peanuts mixed together, neither one is suspended in the other. But an example of a heterogeneous uh, mixture is a, a, the other way. A suspension is an example of a heterogeneous um, mixture. Now, the two components of a solution are called the solute and the solvent. I don't like this definition. It's one you'll run across. A better practical definition is the solute is the small fraction, the solvent is the big fraction. So if we were going to say that, forget the wax, let me hold it by the bottom again, forget the wax, what do you think is the bigger fraction in here, the food coloring or the water? water. The water is the bigger fraction. So the solute is the food coloring. So here's a uh, kind of just an example of stuff you already know. A, an example, uh, oxygen in the room air that we're breathing is basically oxygen and nitrogen. So that's the solute is the oxygen gas, the solvent is the nitrogen gas. If you have a soft drink, carbon dioxide is the solute bubbled into water, that's the solvent. Uh, a liquid in a gas is the reverse, a little bit of water in the air, that's called humidity or fog. A uh, liquid in a liquid, this is like when you pour ethanol in water, like vodka in water. Uh, a liquid in a solid, this one, I don't know if any of you have silver fillings, silver colored fillings in your teeth. Yeah, they don't do on the lot anymore because the, um, the liquid is mercury, which is toxic unless it's bound up in dental amalgam. So liquid mercury in solid silver and tin is called amalgam, dental amalgam. So that's, a mix that's an example of a mixture of a solution. Solid in a liquid is one you know really well. You mix sugar into tea, that's uh, solid sugar in the solute and the liquid solvent. And then finally, solid to solid. This is one you probably know, you just never thought about it being a mixture. And that is, uh, if you're a history buff, you might know about the brass and the bronze age. Anybody? What did that change? Why did it matter to have brass or bronze become popular or important in history? It's stronger. Do you know what brass and bronze are made of? 
You guys, do you know? Um, Copper and what else? Uh, this is copper and uh, zinc, and this one's copper and tin. And then there's other metals. There's other ways to make brass. But when you make what's called an alloy, what you do is you take one metal, for example, copper, coat it with zinc, and then, the, and then heat it. You have to heat it. And then the zinc, I'm going to make the zinc dark, the zinc sort of inserts itself or sometimes substitutes itself in the matrix of the metal, and then it has a stronger characteristic. So let's say you're a, you know, a warrior, and you stick somebody and your wimpy little copper sword bends. No good, right? You want a sword that kills. Well, if you make the sword out of a stronger material, then when you st stick somebody, it won't just bend, it will actually kill them. That's a good thing if you're a warrior. So having stronger metals is really important. Now somebody mentioned steel. I heard somebody mention steel. Steel, um, I'm going to make these bigger. No, that's a bad picture. Let me start that over. Copper, and I'm going to make zinc dark. Look where copper and zinc are on the periodic table. Right next to each other. They're almost the same size. So they substitute out. So this one's called a substitutional alloy. Is that right? Substitutional alloy. Because they're almost the same size. But somebody mentioned steel. What's steel made of? Iron, pretty big, with carbon inserted, because carbon is so small. So this is interstitial. Inter is the prefix for between. So an interstitial alloy is what we all know as steel, so carbon and iron. And the more carbon you put, it changes the, quali the quality of the steel. You might have heard of stainless steel or um, galvani oh, galvanizing is something else. Um, there's another word for other types of steel. And again, if you're into weapons, I mean, say high carbon steel, yeah. I, I've had students who are really into weapons and metallurgy, and you can alter the material by altering the fraction of carbon to steel that ratio. Plus, you can put other metals in there, and then they'll be shiny. Like, you can put chrome on it, and it looks, uh, chromium, I mean, and it looks like chrome, chrome metal. Did you have a question? You all good? Everybody all good? Um, I told you the only difference between colloids is this, the size of the particles. That's all you have to worry about. But then if you look at it and they both look homogeneous, you have to have a way to test which one is which. And that way is called the Tyndall effect. So if you hold a solution that is homogeneous in a beam of light like the projector and you can see a beam of light through it, that's called scattering. If that happens, it's a colloid. Let me say that again, make sure you heard. If you have a solution, it looks homogeneous. A solution is homogeneous. And you hold a light, you can also do it with a laser pointer, which this is a solution, not a colloid, because there's no light. You can see there's no scattering. But if you did that, and you see the beam of light go through the solution, that means the particles are big enough to scatter the light. That means it's a colloid. There is a colloid you know. Probably you've driven through fog. Has everybody driven in fog? So when you have headlights on, when the beams are pointing up, it looks all white and diffuse. That's scattering. When you turn the beams down, you're no longer hitting the gas molecule or the water molecules in front of you, so there's no scattering, so you can see the road better. That's why you put your beams down when you drive in fog. So that effect is called Tyndall. That's how you tell a colloid from a solution. A suspension, you can see. You can see the wax on the bottom. You can see the raisins and the peanuts. So you can tell this one just by looking, but these look alike. The only way you can tell them apart is to shine a light through them. If they're scattering, it's a colloid. These are some colloids you probably know. You just probably don't know these colloid names, which they are. This is our, this is all the material science. It's a kind of a cool field of science. So fog is an example of an aerosol. Smoke, and yes, there's lots of airborne bacteria. That's how we get sick, or touching doorknobs. Those are aerosols. 
foams are things like whipped cream, you know what that is. Milk and mayonnaise are emulsions. They have characteristics that are kind of somewhere between a liquid and a solid. Paint, I'm pretty sure you have seen, it's actually called a sol. That's a word, it's not just short for solution. Marshmallows, we all know, those are solid foam. Liquid foam is butter and cheese. You don't normally think of cheese as a liquid. And colored glass is an example of solid sol. Cool field of science. Lots of different weird uh, no, words. Okay, we already did this one. Electrolyte is what? Electrolytic solution. Electrolyte, what does it have? What does it do? It has ions and it can conduct electricity. You gotta have ions. Our swimming pool here at school, they use a salt to um, uh, re remove the dead bacteria, or the bacteria to clean it. And so it's a, it is an ionic solution. So that means it is an electrolytic solution. So that means that when there's lightning in the area and the swimming pool ladders, ladders get struck, the pool will conduct electricity and that's why you gotta get out as soon as you hear the lightning go out, go off. Um, the non-electrolytes are anything that doesn't dissolve into uh, ions. So what's an example of something that dissolves in water but doesn't make ions? You do this all, you see this every day I bet. Sugar in water only dissolves. It doesn't turn into sugar ions. They're not ions, they're molecules. So sugar is not an electrolyte. Now a lot of you probably buy those electrolyte drinks. And guess what the first ingredient is besides water? Sugar. And then yes, way down at the bottom are the ions. Well that's tap water. So they're selling you tap water but they're selling it as something that replenishes your body's need for electrolytes. Well, tap water, we evolved in a tap water environment. We did not evolve drinking Powerade and Gatorade. So we don't really need Powerade and Gatorade. We just need tap water. That's why you cannot just drink distilled water. You need those ions, these electrolytes, in tap water. Because this is the, what we evolved in. Okay, what's the name of this guy? Barium hydroxide, and it dissolves in water. It's a solid, it dissolves, here's the molar ratio, we haven't done this in a while. One ion of barium and two of uh, hydroxide. What's the name of this guy? Nickel. Nickel. Nickel two. Nickel two sulfate, two ions. This one you just read left to right. Sodium. What's this also called if you bake? Baking soda. It's a solid at room temperature. It dissolves into sodium ions. This ion is just named. This ion, you guys, is just, you read left to right, hydrogen carbonate ion. Oh, that's too easy. This one? Glucose. Glucose. It's no, there's no ions. It just dissolves. That act means that each molecule is surrounded by water. No ions, not an electrolyte. They're lying to you. This one? Copper, copper two sulfate. So remember, you get two nitrates for every um, formula unit of strontium nitrate that dissolves. This one, too easy. This one, you wouldn't know, but I'll tell you, there's no ions involved, so it's not an electrolyte. Okay, solubility. It's dissolving. It's all of these things. When you, and you guys, you have experience with all of this. When you dissolve something, you got to ask, do you have to put energy in or does it give energy off? So if you measure the temperature of the solution when you add an ionic solid, you can tell whether it's endo or exo. If the water gets colder, it means the system required energy to break apart. It's an endothermic uh, dissolving. The surface area. Do you know what a sugar cube looks like? A little square, a little cube. Do you know what powdered sugar looks like? What's the difference? Surface area. So more molecules get exposed to water. You can also stir it. You can break it up with a spoon or stir it. Um, the structure, we're talking about whether something is polar or nonpolar. That's why we did those chapters. So this one is now building onto that knowledge. The temperature, obviously, we, we've talked long about Boltzmann distribution and whether something is uh, more soluble in hot or cold water or a hot or cold environment. 
and solids are different than gases. That's why I put a question mark there. Equilibrium, we have a whole chapter coming on that, but for now, let's just say, we'll just say if something is saturated or not. Do you know the word saturated? Yeah. It means it can't hold anymore. You can, I'll show you that in a sec. And then finally, this is the math. So in this chapter, there's some conceptual stuff and then math again. We're not gonna use that. That's been removed from the AP exam, but many of my seniors, this is an old AP PowerPoint, many of my seniors are still expected to know this in university, so I still cover it, we just don't test on it. Okay, this is all stuff you know, you just maybe never thought about it in this way. So first of all, uh, I already said, if you grind up a sugar cube and make it into powdered sugar, you increase the surface area, it will dissolve better. It, <clears throat> excuse me, if you stir something, it will go into solution better. But what about the temperature? Well, if you put sugar into cold tea versus hot tea, you already know which one's gonna dissolve better, right? Hot tea. So here's how it works. If you could zoom in and look at the molecules or ions. Let's say you have sugar or let's use sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, big, huge crystal. What's holding those together? Ionic IMFs known as what? the lattice energy. You have to put a lot of energy in to separate the ions. So this is endothermic, it says delta H1. That's a positive number. So that's the solute, either the sugar crystal or the sodium chloride. You also have to do the same to the water. What kind of an IMF is water holding on with? not ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds. All the water molecules are holding on pretty well. High heat capacity, high specific heat, remember? You have to pull them apart from each other. That's an endothermic process. But when you put the whole thing together, you put the sugar in the water or the sodium chloride in the water, something like magic happens. You may not recognize it yet. I bet I'll get you there. But look what happens. It's all distributed. All of the particles of the solute are distributed amongst the solute. Uh, solvent. This could be positive or negative. In this case, it's exothermic. So all you have to do is add up all those delta H's, and we call that sum the heat of the solution. We've already talked about heat of formation, heat of reaction, well now this is, or heat of combustion, that was another one we had. Now we have heat of solution. You guys look up here a sec. There's no chemical reaction going on. It's not a combustion reaction. It's just dissolving, it's a physical change. But it has a heat involved, either positive or negative. So it's either endo or exo. And we call that the heat of the solution. So now the question is, how come for many of them, for many ionic solids do, do, um, dissolving in water, you have to put energy in. You guys have been dissolving salt in all your life in water or sugar. It's an endothermic process. But you never put heat in. So how come it dissolves so readily? Room Even room temperature, you still sometimes have to stir it to get it to go in, and that's not quite enough energy, but there's something right here in this, this picture compared to these pictures. Say again, Jasmine? They are spread out more. Uh, well, it could be ions, though, too. Um, more than that. Okay, look at this compared to this. What's the difference? Just this. I can't hear you. They are expanded, but there's something else. It's not orderly. This one's orderly, and this one is not. What's that word? You may have done it in physics. Sorry. Chaos. And the word in chemistry, it's more chaotic. The word in chemistry is entropy. So we have enthalpy already. We talked about enthalpy. That's heat. Entropy is chaos. Or randomness. You can use either word. Our universe tends which way? More or less random? Okay, do Jenga blocks stay all in a row? Do the trees all stay away from the roads in Singapore? 
No, our universe goes to higher chaos. Our universe is expanding. That's why our universe becomes more chaotic. So you guys, this change from very, very ordered to very disordered is a driving force in chemistry for reactions and processes to happen. And it's enough to drive this reaction, even though it's endothermic. So we have more on that coming later in the year. Uh, let's look at what the general trend is when you put some grams of different stuff into different temperatures of water. Hey, you guys. So that amount of stuff is called the solubility. And its units are grams of the solute in 100 grams of water. Okay, so grams of solute in 100 grams of water. 100 grams of water is 100 mils, not much water. How many grams can you put in before the solution is saturated? How do you know it's saturated? It won't mix in anymore. It just falls straight to the bottom of the beaker. So let's look at something you know. Maybe not. Potassium nitrate. It's an ionic compound. It's pretty harmless. So look at this line here, you guys. At 25 degrees, at room temperature, we go up to the line and over right about there. Well, it's about 30. Let's just say 30 grams. When you get to 30 grams in 100 mils of water at 25 degrees, it will all stir in. If you put one more sprinkle of potassium nitrate in, it just goes straight to the bottom of the beaker. No matter how much you stir, as long as you keep the temperature constant, it will not dissolve. So the word we use is saturated. So if you go above that line with the amount that you put in, it just goes straight to the bottom. All of this area is saturated. But if you have only put in 20 grams, it's still unsaturated. It all goes in. You put in a few more grams, it all goes in. You're still unsaturated. Until you reach this line, and that is an equilibrium line, then you saturated the solution. So I'm going to pull out the blue line and show it on the next slide. Whoops, sorry. Next, next slide. Before we go there, what's the overall trend for ionic compounds as a function of temperature for the solubility? Most of them are doing what? Say again? Most of the lines on this graph are increasing or decreasing with temperature? Increasing. There's only two that decrease. So pretty much all the time, if you warm up a solid, the water, if you warm up the water, the solute, solids will dissolve better. But what about Coke? Coca-Cola. If you pretend this word is carbon dioxide, because for some reason it's not on here. You take a Coke out of the fridge, it's five, four degrees. Carbon dioxide is pretty soluble. The Coke has a lot of bubbles in it. And then you let it sit on the counter until it gets to 25 degrees. And then you take a drink, and it's flat. That's because the solubility went down as the temperature rose. So what happens if you take a Coke out of the fridge at 4 degrees, full of carbon dioxide, guzzle it down, and your body temperature is over here? You burp. So now you know why you burp. You've probably always wondered, how do I get these noises to come out my mouth? Now you know, because the general trend for gas solubility with temperature is an inverse relationship. As the temperature goes up, the gas solubility goes down. So you already know this, you guys, with your own experience of burping. So this is what I already referred to, saturated, uh, unsaturated. And then this word, supersaturated. This word means that you put so much in, no more will dissolve. You've, you're on that line now. So look at KNO3. I'm going to pull it out by itself, just to make it clear. Anywhere along the line is saturated. So if you're at 25 degrees and you've put in 35 grams in 100 mils, no, it all will go in. One more crystal will just fall straight to the bottom. If you're below that, 65 degrees and 60 grams, it'll all stir in. But if you go above that, the crystals just fall to the bottom. So that is called a supersaturated solution. However, some of you might have seen a solution that you warm up to, say, 80 degrees. So that means you have to put in 
165 grams of potassium nitrate. It all goes in solution. And then you just set the beaker, you leave it on the hot plate, and then the hot plate just slowly cools. So you're going back this, you're here at this line, you're slowly going this way. But the crystals don't form. Normally the crystals will just fall out. But some compounds, particularly sodium acetate, the crystals don't fall out until you put something like a probe into the solution and then it suddenly crystallizes. Have you seen this? Oh, yeah. I'll show you a YouTube. I'll show you a YouTube of it. If you do it with a probe, the probe provides what's called a nucleation site. You can just think of it as a launch pad for the crystals to grow. So the nucleation site could be a probe. You could sprinkle in a few more bits of sodium acetate and they provide the, uh, the nucleation site. Or sometimes even the bottom of the beaker is scratched and that's where the crystals will start forming. Sometimes you can just tap it and maybe there's some dust on the surface and it's enough to provide a nucleation site. But the, the key to doing that is to warm it up, put a whole bunch in until you're saturated and then very slowly cool it. And it all stays, it looks like a solution. You don't see crystal forming. Normally the crystals just fall out, but sodium acetate is pretty cool because it does that. I'll show you YouTube in a sec. So let's go back to solubility, sodium chloride. Here's a great big crystal. Here's the water. Look at, there's the positive end attracted to the negative ion, the chloride ion. Kind of teases it out and look what happens. Surrounds the anion. The same thing happens with the negative end of water gets attracted to the positive cation, teases it out, and then all of them are, all of the water molecules are surrounding the cation. That word is called solvation. This isn't what happens when you go to church. That's salvation. This is solvation. So when the molecule or the ions are solvated, it means they're surrounded by water. Uh, what else? Okay, now this next part, I'm gonna have to show you a YouTube and the sodium acetate. The first one, I need to make sure everybody has seen the movie Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz? Arsh, you've never seen Wizard of Oz? Everyone else knows? This is gonna be so cool for Arsh. He's a Wizard of Oz virgin. Uh, Raymond, would you get the lights please? Okay, so first of all, I got to make sure you all know there's a wicked witch and she's got the little evil flying monkeys who are like her henchmen. So, look at the structure of the flying monkeys. Okay, do you see the flying monkey's physical structure? They've got wings, okay? Now, the next thing you need to notice is what happens when they show Dorothy and her friends in the forest. I'll, I'll try to stop this so you can see it. Yes. All right, so there goes the flying monkeys. Their wings are out. Now watch. Dorothy and her friends. Watch what happens, right there. Did you see it? Did you miss it? They clump together. Watch, ready? Right there, ionic attraction. They clump together. There, there's, and look, now they're holding hands. And here comes the, what's coming? The water molecules. There they go. There, look, watch what happens. Look. This water, these water molecules pull this ion away. There's the Tin Man. She's getting away, but she's gonna get solvated in just a sec. <laughs> now look, the Tin Man, totally, there's the Scarecrow, totally solvated. And finally, there she goes. At the end, Toto, he's the last ion, watch. He gets scarfed up, 
There he goes. Water molecule takes him off. <laughs> All right, that's the water molecules. And now, here's sodium acetate in water. So the first one is, it looks like a solution, and you can see him or her up there. It's homogeneous, you can't see anything, and they drop in a probe. So it provides the nucleation site, and immediately the crystals of sodium acetate just start forming. So liquid, supersaturated solution, sodium acetate crystals. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Here's another one. You might have seen uh, stalactites or stalagmites. There's the supersaturated solution. They pour it in a petri dish. And there's good music. And right there, the crystals are forming. So there must have been something in the, in the solution to provide the nucleation site. And then the crystal, and this is in real time. This isn't sped up at all. And you might have been in a cave where you see, see stalagmites and stalactites. It's a very similar concept. There's a saturated solution. And then they start pouring it. So you can just start making stalagmites. There they are at the beginning. They're just pouring in, it starts building up. So the solution is saturated and the crystals fall out and just start building up. This is exactly what happens in a cave, like a limestone cave that has stalactites and stalagmites. But what's really nice is that when you see it, they have different minerals and so they're different colors. It's gorgeous. All right, cool, huh?